Hi, everybody, and a very pleasant good evening to you wherever you may be. This is Comfortably Zone Radio, and it's time for Dodgers baseball, a tale of two cities from Brooklyn to Los Angeles. I'm your host, Peter Trunk, and my co-host tonight is Linda Wilson. Hello there, Linda. How are you? Hi, Peter. Doing good. Thank you. How about you? There you go. I'm doing okay, I guess. You know, a little depressed the last uh, couple of weeks, but you know why. Yeah. But uh, I'll, snap, I'll snap out of it. Well, mm-hmm. if you want to start tonight, we're going to do a little bit. We're going to stick to happy days for the Dodgers tonight. We're going to talk about, in Brooklyn, we're going to talk about the 1955 Dodgers. You can't get any happier than that year. And then we're going to switch it out to the left coast with Linda Wilson, and she's going to talk about the 81 and 88 Dodgers. Also, very happy years in Dodgerville, Dodger Town, whatever you want to call it. I guess we can't call it Dodger Town. That's something else. Well, anyway, let me start off with the 1955 Dodgers. I know that most baseball fans and all Dodger fans know everything there is to know about 1955. I just wanted to touch upon a few things. They clinched the pennant, the Dodgers did, on September the 8th, which is still a major league record for the earliest clinching of a pennant ever. And um, that is very that's – a, that's a formidable uh, record, uh, knowing that the New York Yankees clinched so many pennants in the American League. But never that early. The Dodgers of 1955 clinched the pennant, the earliest date on record before or since September the 8th. They finished 13 and a half games ahead of Milwaukee, who was in second place. The Dodgers team that year led the National League in runs scored. But not only that, they also led the National League in fewest runs allowed. They started the season 22-2. and two. They won their first 11 games, and then they lost one. Then they won their next 11 games and lost one. So they were 22-2, and two, which is one heck of a start. And people soured on that because they said that the Dodgers doing what they did in 1955 so early was that they hurt all the other National League clubs in attendance. There wasn't really a race in the National League in 1955, and therefore other teams' gate suffered. But uh, whatever. Maybe that's true. Maybe it's not. Their catcher, Roy Campanella, won his third Most Valuable Player Award in five years in 1955. And there was a bit of a controversy in the voting. Um, they had, like they do today, they have – they give point like like the writers would would vote for the first place finisher, the second place finisher, the third place finisher, the fourth place, and so on and so forth. And each of these places was designated a total points. Let's say uh, your first place guy gets eight points, your second place guy gets seven points, your third place guy gets six points, et cetera, et cetera. Anyway, on one of the ballots. The Philadelphia writer, each each club in the National League had a writer that voted for most valuable player back then. The Philadelphia writer put Campanella first, and he also put Campanella fifth. And the committee looked at it, and they said, what the heck is this? You can't vote for a guy first and fifth. And other people tried to say, because this guy was in the hospital or something, they couldn't get in touch with him. And one of his friends said what he meant to do was put Duke Snyder fifth. Yeah. He wanted Campanella first, but he wanted to vote for Duke Snyder fifth. Well, the, the head said, can't, can't do it. We can't switch a name. So they just discounted that ballot. And uh, Campanella won the Most Valuable Player Award. Now, if Snyder had been fifth on that guy's ballot, Snyder would have won. <laughs> or if they threw that ballot out completely, Snyder would have won. But Campanella won. Anyway, it was his fifth it was his third most valuable player award in five seasons. 
that's quite that's quite something, especially back then. Newcomb, Don Newcomb, uh, won twenty games. He went. He finished twenty and five. He was the first black pitcher to win twenty games in history. Snyder, Campanella, Hodges, and Newcomb were all on the All Star team. Alston made Manager of the Year. Snyder, who had forty two home runs that year, led all of Major League Baseball in runs scored, one hundred and twenty six, and runs batted in, one hundred and thirty six. So it was quite a year for the Brooklyn Dodgers. The Dodgers back then in 1955 had, believe it or not, 15 farm clubs, including two in AAA and two in AA. Uh, six of the 1955 Dodgers are in the Baseball Hall of Fame. During the season, on July the 22nd, 1955, they held Pee Wee Reese Night at Ebbets Field for Pee Wee's 37th birthday. Actually, Pee Wee's 37th birthday would have been the day after, but it didn't coincide with their home schedule, so they did it a day early on July 22nd. And Irving Rudd, R-U-D-D, who was the promotions director for the Brooklyn Dodgers back then, one of the promotions was Irving Rudd got a Chrysler Imperial, a Buick, a Dodge, and a Chevrolet, and he had them driven in to uh, Ebbets Field, uh, through the gate in center field. And what was supposed to take place and did take place was that Reese's daughter, Barbara, was going to fish car keys out of a fishbowl to see which uh, car the keys would start up. So there was like all these car keys in this fishbowl and Reese's daughter put her hand in and took a key out and then tried to start the car. Whichever car started, that was the one they were going to give to Reese. So she went and she tried to start the Chrysler Imperial, and it wouldn't start. She tried to start the Buick, and it wouldn't start. She tried to start the Dodge, and it wouldn't start. And the crowd started groaning and booing as, of course, the keys started. The cheapest of all, the Chevrolet. Uh, anyway, the Dodgers won the game 8-4. to four. Pee Wee contributed two doubles in the game. The next day, Campanella confronted Irving Rudd, the uh, promotions director for the Brooklyn Dodgers, and he said, Irv, what the hell is wrong with you? And Irving said, what are you talking about? He said, last night, why didn't you make sure that Barbara uh, Reese got the keys to the Chrysler Imperial? And Irving Rudd looked at him and said, well, she didn't. She picked the keys that started the Chevrolet. And Campanella said, but you should have fixed it. So she fished out the keys for the Chrysler Imperial. And Irving Rudd looked at Campanella and said, but that would be cheating. Campanella looked it back at him and said, shit, I'd swim through six feet of shit to get a Chrysler Imperial for nothing. I can't believe you didn't fix it for Pee Wee. Anyway, that was that was Campanella for you. Um, on, um, let's see, where was I? I was at Pee Wee Reese, <clears throat> Pee Wee Reese night. Okay, all right. Now, September the fifth. Let's go to September the fifth. First game of a doubleheader versus Philadelphia. Newcomb won his twentieth game. He also hit his seventh home run. Newcomb did, which set the National League record for pitchers. Home runs in a season. He also had 359 that year. 359. Okay. 15,000 people. This was a doubleheader. Uh, September the 5th, Labor Day doubleheader at Ebbets Field. 15,000 people were turned away uh, for that game. So they really, really packing them in. Um, three days later, the Dodgers clinched on September the 8th, and the World Series actually started. You're not going to believe this because you're a young woman, a young baseball fan, relatively speaking, Linda. The World Series started on September the 28th. Mm -hmm. okay? And then, of course, back in those days, it didn't matter that they were Brooklyn versus New York. It could have been anybody. There were no off days. Right. It only started later on. So it's seven days 
and that was the World Series. <clears throat> so in game one, the Dodgers send Newcomb to the mound, even though he had a stiff back by this time and a sore shoulder, and they put him out there against Whitey Ford. And despite Jackie Robinson stealing home in the eighth inning, the Yankees prevailed six to five. Okay, so the Dodgers are down one game to nothing. The next game in Yankee Stadium, the Dodgers uh, only managed five hits against the off-speed junk of uh, Tommy Byrne, the left-hander for the Yankees. And the Yankees won that game four to two. And, of course, cries of wait till next year came from Brooklyn fans all throughout the borough and around New York and New Jersey because no team had ever come back in a World Series being down two games to nothing. Mm-hmm. So the faithful were plentiful as no team. You know, what, what am I going to say? Everybody, I was only nine years old, but I remember my my father, my mother, my oldest sister's boyfriend, my older brother, they were all down in the dumps. They all, not one of them held a belief, a flicker of a flame of a hope that the Dodgers would come back. Like I said, it was never done before. So they're down no games, no games to two, but they're coming back to Edis Field for game three. Now, on, the, on his 23rd birthday, Johnny Padres was the surprise starter for the Dodgers. <clears throat> And the Dodgers won game three, eight to three, um, to give them a little bit of life, a little bit of hope. It was that day, by the way, a very famous thing happened when Buckminster Fuller in Princeton, New Jersey, revealed his plans for the domed Dodger Stadium in right. Brooklyn. Uh, I'm sure you've seen many photographs of O'Malley with this guy, uh, this engineer, showing what Dodger Stadium was going to look like with its dome and all that stuff. That was done after Game 3 of the 55 World Series. Game 4, the next day, Ersk, our man Erskine pitched. Can't be hit a home run. Gill hit a home run. Duke hit a three-run home run. And the Dodgers won 8-5 to five to tie this series at two games apiece. Now, Austin again surprised everybody by starting a rookie in game five, the all-important game five. Roger Craig, 36,796 people shoehorned their way in to Ebbets Field that day. They only had 32,000 seats, so they had almost 5,000 people standing. Amoros' two-run homer, Duke hit a solo shot, made it three to nothing in the third inning. Another Duke Snyder home run made it 5-3. to three. The Dodgers won it, and it's back to Yankee Stadium with the Dodgers actually leading three games to two, and they're going to Yankee Stadium for game six. Now, in game six, Austin pulls another rabbit out of his hat, and he starts left-hander Carl Spooner. Now, I don't know how much you know about Carl Spooner, but he was supposed to be what Koufax became. Mm-hmm. Carl Spooner's yeah. first, first two starts, in his major league career, he struck out 27 batters. He struck out 12 Cubs and 15 Giants. Okay, he had 27 strikeouts in two starts. Um, anyway, he's the starting pitcher in game six, filling in for Newcomb, who had the bad back and uh, also had a stomach virus. Don't you know Carl Spooner gives up five runs in the bottom of the first inning to the Yankees, including a three-run homer to Scarron. The Dodgers pitching staff held the Yankees for the rest of the way. They shut them out for the next eight innings, but the Yankees won 5-1. to one. So now the games are tied at three apiece. Game seven is coming up, and it's going to be at Yankee Stadium. Jackie Robinson comes to the park and tells Austin he can't play. Now, you know Jackie Robinson had to be hurt if he sat out at Game 7 of the World Series. He had a strained Achilles tendon, and they were afraid if he played that he would snap it. So he sat out, and Don Hoke played third base. Snyder also had popped something in his knee the week before, um, and 
he was playing on a very swollen knee. I don't know if it was the right one or the left one. I know Duke had problems with both of his knees, and after the 1957 season, actually had surgery. But uh, he did feel something pop in his knee a couple of games before that, but he did start anyway. And it was Johnny Padres against Tommy Byrne again. Tommy Byrne, the junk-throwing left-hander. Well, on the way, the Dodgers met at Ebbets Field, and they got on a bus, and they drove to Yankee Stadium. And when Padres got on the bus, he said he stood up and he announced to the rest of his teammates, I only need one run today, guys. That's all I need is one run. So everybody sort of like smiled and stuff, and it broke the tension a little bit, I suppose. The game starts. Hodges hits a single after Camp. Campy hits a double, and Hodges hits a single. It's one nothing Dodgers. There's his run. He only said he needed one run. With the bases loaded later in the game, Hodges flied out to center field, sacrifice fly. Now it's 2 nothing Brooklyn. In the sixth inning, Amaros had been inserted into the left field, and Gilliam came in to play second base. They took Zimmer out. Um, so Amaros is out and left. And this, the Yankees' sixth inning, Martin singles and McDougal singles, or Martin walks and McDougal singles, whatever. Martin's on first. Martin's on second. McDougal is on first. There's nobody out. And here comes Yogi Berra. And uh, we've all seen the films. We've all seen the pictures. Berra slices one down the left field line. Looks like it's going for extra bases. Amaros, uh, who later it was uh, figured out by whoever figures out these things, sprinted 150 feet toward the wall and the foul line, the corner, outstretched his glove, caught the ball. Not only did he catch the ball, he stopped himself short, turned around and threw to Pee Wee Reese. Reese in turn threw back to Hodges, and they actually doubled McDougal off of first base. So that killed the rally. And the Dodgers went on to win and win their first and only World Series in Brooklyn. And that's a nutshell recap of 1955. What I'd like to do is turn it over to my co-host, Linda Wilson, and we'll hear about some Los Angeles happy times. I believe 1981 and 1988. Linda Wilson, go ahead. Well, hello. Okay. Um, 1981 was the year of the players' strike, and uh, so that split the season in the middle of the, the middle of the summer. And uh, this is the coming up a uh, few months after the Dodgers had just lost the National League West. That was the old National League West realignment or alignment um, with the six teams, including the Houston Astros, Cincinnati Reds, and Atlanta Braves. So they had just lost the, um, on the last weekend of the season, they forced an extra one-game playoff because the Astros and Dodgers had been tied um, at the on the last day of the season. And uh, the Astros won that playoff game at Dodger Stadium. So that there was some lingering uh, pain from from that series as well as from the Dodgers' um, two World Series losses to the Yankees in 77 and 78. Mm-hmm. So going into the 81 season, uh, they have most of their uh, team intact, still have the great infield together, and this would be the last uh, full season that they would play together. And uh, that infield was uh, instrumental in uh, helping uh, in achieving their crowning glory after having played together for eight years by winning the World Series. Now, Could you tell us who they were again, Linda? Yeah, so Ron Re- Kay, Remind us who they were again. <laughs> Ron Kay at third base, Bill Russell at shortstop, Daisy Lopes at second base, and Steve Garvey, the Iron Man at first. There so, you go. Uh, the the uh, team was pretty much intact, and the only major change that happened came about as a, a matter of injury 
on opening day 1981. The Dodgers were playing uh, at home against the Astros, a team that they had just lost to in September. And uh, Jerry Royce was supposed to get the start and ended up injured, and Tommy Lasorda decided to test this young rookie pitcher out of Mexico named Fernando Valenzuela. Now, (laughs) Fernando had appeared in a few games in that September series against the Astros that ended the season. And uh, fans got a glimpse of, you know, what he had. He had a a phenomenal screwball, and he seemed seemed to have a lot of poise that – somebody his age, which at that time, when in the September series, he was 19, he turned 20 during the off season, and he pitched the uh, opening game at Dodger Stadium in 81, and in, in place of Jerry Royce, and shut out the Astros for the complete game, and that was just the beginning, because he had a phenomenal first half of the season, and took the city by storm, took Los Angeles, uh, the entire Mexican-American population of, of L.A. Was, Fernando Mania. Yep, it was, and, it, and, he, and he took everybody else along with it. It wasn't just that. It was all the other fans just absolutely fell in love with this guy. And Fernando Valenzuela, Fernando Valenzuela is one of the only guys – I have a few. I have a lot of Dodger um, jerseys, and I only have a few of them from Los Angeles. But Fernando Valenzuela, I have his jersey. Wow. I saw him pitch live in New York when he came to pitch against the Mets. He was just absolutely – he was a freak. He was phenomenal. He was absolutely phenomenal. But go ahead. Well, he – carried the team through the first half of the season. And the player strike came about in July and lasted till the end of August. And at that time, the owners decided that they, instead of uh, instead of having division winners based on their overall record, that they would have two division winners, one from the first half of the season and one from the second half of the season. So the Cincinnati Reds happened to be the winners from the second half of the season. But uh, I'm sorry, I take that back. The Cincinnati Reds have the best overall record. And okay. They, but they did not go to the playoffs because there were two other winners of the two halves of the season. I remember that. Now that you mention it, I remember that. The that Dodgers was quite the controversy. Were the Yes, it was, because they had the best overall record. They did, They sat home. The Dodgers had the first half best record, and the Astros had the second half best record. So it set, a, set the stage for a rematch of the previous um, year's season-ending series, which had featured the Dodgers and Astros. So this time... Uh, the Dodgers and the Astros started that series, and it was a best of five. And it was played starting in the Astrodome. And the Astros won two tight, very close, well-pitched games and took a 2 nothing lead in the series. And the, but the next three games were played in L.A. Well, the Last two games of that series were won by Fernando and Jerry Royce. The two, if you if you remember back to the beginning of the season, Fernando had taken over for Jerry Royce. Those two won mm-hmm. the last two games of the season as the Dodgers came. Or the last two games of that uh, playoff series as the Dodgers came back from an 0-2 deficit. Then they went on to play in the National League Championship Series. That, by the way, was the first ever division series before division series were instituted. So they had the distinct honor of playing. Interesting. Three yeah, three rounds of the playoffs before any other team. Interesting. Uh, win, uh, winning the World Series after three wins, three rounds of the playoffs. Yeah. So they went on to play the uh, Montreal Expos, then Montreal Expos, and 
in the National League Championship Series. And one on the road uh, in Montreal and ended up having facing the Yankees again, which they had played in 77 and 78 and had those heartbreaking losses. To. This time, uh, Fernando might have been the difference. So for some reason, there was just a little bit more of a spark, and they were able to beat the, the Yankees in six games. Now, given Didn't they lose the first two and then win four in a row? Yeah, games games one and two were played in Yankee Stadium, and they lost those two. So they came back. I remember I remember after they lost the first two games, I was still teaching back then. I went in to the teacher's room, and, of course, all Yankee fans in there. And I came in, and they all looked at me, and they started to give me, you know, they started hiking on me and stuff. And I said, gentlemen, we got them right where we want them. That's right. <laughs> and they came back, and they won four in a row. By the way, they came back to beat the Expos, too. They were yeah. down. They they yeah. came back. Rick Monday hit the home run to win the right. final game, 2-1. to one. And I remember yeah. what the headline was in the next day's paper. Here on the East Coast, the headline was, Monday gives Dodgers Tuesday. Yeah, and that was it because uh, that game was played on a Monday afternoon. That. And the, and Tuesday was the first game of the World Series. That's right. Right. <clears throat> okay. So, so they stayed in the Eastern time zone to start the World Series. They lost the first two, came home, and won the next three. Now, Fernando pitched game three at home in Dodger Stadium, and uh, he, uh, if I recall correctly, he had he had uh, faced quite a challenge as the Yankees. He was on the ropes all night long, but he still managed to get the win. And I remember Vince Scully's call was this was not Fernando's best game, but it was his finest. So <laughs> that tied the series. At, or, I'm sorry, that put the Dodgers in their, uh, the win column in the series. So they were down 2-1. to one. They won the next two, took the 3-2 to two lead back to Yankee Stadium, and there was a little bit of controversy in Game 6. Because Tommy John, former Dodger, was on the mound, and uh, Bob Berman, the Yankees manager, removed him early. And I, I remember Tommy John being very upset about that. And from that point on, the Yankees bullpen pretty much imploded, and the Dodgers started pouring on the offense. And they won nine to two in Yankee Stadium, and got their first world championship in 16 years in Los Angeles. So, I mean, since the 1965 World Series, so that was 16 years earlier, and it was the first one right. with this particular team with that infield unit and with the, all the power hitters that they had at that time. And it was it was really an exciting time to, to be a Dodger fan. I especially with the Fernando mania. You know, you had this guy in his first season um, at age 20 win both the Rookie of the Year and Cy Young Award and mm -hmm. the uh, World Series Championship on top of it. So yeah. it, was, uh, it was a great time. I, I remember taking time off work and going to the parade in L.A. and uh, never had – I never had felt anything quite like that as far as the Dodgers had gone, you know, and it, I, it left me wanting more. So, unfortunately, they did not repeat or uh, get back to the World Series for another seven years. And they got close in 1985 when they played the Cardinals in the NLC. Mm -hmm. and Jack right. Mark Sullivan kept them out of that. So, 1988. Completely different team, or pretty much different team. The only, uh, I would say, the only major players left from the '81 team, uh, seven years later, were the catcher Mike Mike Sosha, who had been a rookie in '81, and of course Fernando. Uh, but Oral Hershiser had established himself as the ace of the staff by this time, and he did win the Cy Young Award with that year, and as well as winning the uh, World Series MVP. 
Now, the, the newcomer to the team that made the most impact, of course, is Kurt Gibson. He's been signed as a free agent and uh, won the National League uh, MVP award. And was even with, rel I guess what you would consider today, you would consider them to be relatively moderate numbers for an, an MVP. Um, Very modest RBIs, 76 RBIs. Yeah, right. And uh, he, he still did. He, he had a tremendous impact on the team, but he ended up injured and was unable to play in game one. Well, first they, they, had, they had played the Mets, as you know, and as you well remember, that great series between the Dodgers and the Mets. The Mets were completely expected to just trounce the Dodgers, and yep. there, was, there was supposed to be any kind of contest there. And um, They had beaten them 11 out of 12 during this regular right, season. Exactly. During the regular season, 11 out of 12. And so yeah. there, there was good reason to believe. They, you know, they were very, very talent-laden, uh, the Mets were, and the Dodgers had a very average offense other than Gibson. They uh, their infielders were nobody that reminded you of the great infield unit of 1981. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. uh, they still managed to get by mostly on great pitching because they had uh, Oral Hershiser, Tim Belcher, several others that were, but obviously Hershiser being the main contributor, being that he won the Cy Young that year. Yeah. Anyway, he won uh, Game 7 of the NLCS at Dodger Stadium, and it was it was amazing to think that that team could have beaten the New York Mets. It was almost like David beating Goliath. Well, that wasn't the first time they were going to have to do that, because they were going to have to face the same kind of challenge in the Oakland A's in the World Series. So... Game one, of course, as everybody knows, Kurt Gibson was not going to play. He was in too much pain. And Ben Scully even said before the game that Gibson won't be in the lineup tonight. And other people will recall that Bob Costas had mentioned before the game started that this is possibly, the Dodgers are possibly the worst World Series team ever to take the field. <laughs> so, that said, uh, it was it was it was quite a game because it, Jose Canseco for the A's hit a grand slam, putting the Dodgers up on uh, the Belcher, and the the score was four to three going into the ninth inning, and Mike Davis got on base, stole a base. And Gibson, Gibson had come up during that time, um, not knowing until – nobody knew until he appeared in uniform in the dugout that he was either ready to play or available. And so they had two down, nobody on base – or I'm sorry, Mike Davis on base and inserted Gibson as a pinch hitter. Now, the he was in so much pain that the – the concern was even if even if he got a hit, would he be able to run the bases? So exactly. As it turned out, you know, it turned out would he would he make it to first? Well, as it turned out, he ended up having to make it around to all the bases. But he um, went took the to Dennis Eckersley full count, and Eckersley at that time was uh, had not been beaten as a closer all, all season long. He had had a perfect record and was just ready to come in and close this one out and make it one one win for the A's and move on to game two. So here comes Gibson into the odd deck circle. The crowd's going crazy and comes up and takes the count up to full count and then he hits that monstrous home run to the right field pavilion, which Jack Clark, I mean, I'm sorry. <laughs> Jack Buck at the time was doing. <laughs> Jack Buck at the time was doing the uh, uh, radio call for I believe uh -huh. TV radio, and he said, "I don't believe what I just saw." He repeated it. I don't right. believe what I just saw. 
So here comes right. Gibson um, limping around the bases. Nobody could believe it. And the Dodgers have won 5-4 to four on this walk off a run. And Vin Scully's comment was that by the, t- by the time Vin had led all the, all the mm-hmm. pre-required pre- silence pass for, so that the crowd, sound of the crowd yep. could be heard, uh, yep. he said, and now the question was, could he make it around the base pass unassisted? And then there was uh, there were a few comments about how the Dodgers MVP of the year had been considered to be Tinkerbell because they had so many magical unexpected things happen. And then mm-hmm. I think tonight Tinkerbell moved over for Kirk Gibson, <laughs> and that was well such <laughs> a great call when he said the you know uh, in a year that had been so improbable the impossible has happened. So there were several great calls connected with that home run. Every time I hear that call, I get goosebumps. I do, too. Every I time too. I hear Vince Scully say that, I get goosebumps. It's, it's hard not to, I know. And then after that, it was <laughs> almost anticlimactic. They had to play game two. Yeah. Well, surprisingly, yeah. the Dodgers won that game, too. So who would have thought that going up against this uh, offensive powerhouse in the Oakland A's, uh, you know, they – we're known as the Bash Brothers with Mark McGuire and Jose Canseco. Mm-hmm. Uh, who would have thought that they would, the Dodgers would take a 2 nothing lead on them? Well, they did. They went back to Oakland. Now, the A's only won one of the next two games, and uh, the Dodgers were able to put it away in Oakland in game five with three yep. guys on the mound. And who yeah. else, I mean, who else would be able to, who else would, Finish up the season, uh, you know, winning the World Series with Hershiser, the guy who had carried them all year long. So these two uh, seasons of 1981 and 88 in the same decade were both exciting ones for the Dodgers, but both very, very different seasons, very, very different teams. Uh, one, you had a, a veteran pitcher as the A's. Early, in the 81 series, you had, or in the 81 season, you had Fernando, the rookie of the A's. And the two teams couldn't have been more different because one was a very offensively offensive powerhouse team in 1981 with uh, the four great sluggers that had hit 30 home runs in the 77 season. So you had Reggie Stewart, mm-hmm. Steve Garvey, Ron Fay, and Dusty Baker. And all of these guys have been together for a few years now. And so in 81, they kind of finished off the, their careers together before they started breaking up that team. That right. 88 was so different because they had a, a mix of um, young, young young Dodger players and free agents and a couple of guys acquired in, in trades, but no real big names other than Kirk Gibson. So that 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 one that World Series was more of a unexpected win and just very very magical in its own way. Where in '81 they had all the right players that you knew yeah. they could win, and they did. But it's just two different, very very different uh, teams. And baseball is a both, funny game. Yeah, and they were both and they were both um, you know very. Uh, very different times in my life. Uh, first first year in 81 when they won, I remember I had, I had turned 21, you know, the year earlier, so I could actually celebrate with a drink. <laughs> and uh, 88, <laughs> 88, I was thinking, oh, my gosh, I'm almost I'm almost 30. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> oh, my gosh. My, my whole 20s went by in that, in that decade. <laughs> so that was uh, – that was that was quite a decade for the Dodgers. They had three NLCS appearances and the, the two World Series wins. And uh, again, with very different personnel contributing to them. I didn't think that we would ever go 29 years without seeing them win another World Series or even playing in one. But that's where we're at now. Yeah. So, uh, we have. A, you know, the more I the more I think about the Dodgers of present day Dodgers it's mm-hmm. like it's it's it would I hate to say it this way but it's going to take a miracle for them to win next year 
because they're they they probably won't have uh, Kenley Jansen, and um, I don't know what they're going to do about second base. I don't know if they're going to have Turner. I don't, you know. Yeah, there's not so, many so questions. sure. Right now, we're so early in the off season. We have a lot of question marks. We're very, very early. We're very early in the, in, the, in the off season. However, when you're a baseball nut like we are, yeah. you think about these things constantly. It doesn't matter if you're four months out from opening day or four days out from opening day. You think about your teams or your team singular. I have a few teams I root for, but yeah. when I think of the Dodgers, when I think of the Dodgers, I think I don't I don't see them doing it. I really don't see them doing it. I just they don't have dominant pitching. They got one dominant pitcher, and we know his whole story. Okay. Well, we'll see. We'll see we, what we do as far as uh, shoring that pitching rotation up. We'll see. I don't know. I'm not predicting miracles, but. No, I'm not predicting miracles either, uh-huh. but you know, if, if if you and I if you and I were sitting in a bar right now having a few drinks, we'd uh-huh. be talking about you know, we could get Chris Sale, we could get uh Chapman for the bullpen, we can get uh Cespedes to play the outfield, we can do this, we can do that. Soberly sitting in our uh living rooms now, we look at the reality and you are correct, it's extremely early. And there might even be a lockout. We don't even know that yet. That's they, true. They don't even know if they're going to have a new CBA. You know, they, they right. everything's up in the air. But just looking coldly at the facts, I would not be very hot for the Dodgers to win the World Series next year. I mean, last year at this time, 365 days ago tonight, mm-hmm. I would have been, and I, I, I can honestly say this to you, honestly say this to you, I knew in my heart that if the Cubs didn't win it, they were going to be right there, and they'd probably lose it on a heartbreak thing, but they were going to be there. They were loaded. They were absolutely loaded were the Cubs, and they had the best manager, in my opinion, although he did overmanage this year in the World Series, but... Um, I knew back then that the Cubs had a super, 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 super team and that they probably would win it against all odds because of they're the Cubs. They're the Cubs, you know, the old losers. But looking at the Dodgers right now, there's about 10 teams in front of the Dodgers with a chance to win the World Series in my, in my baseball heart right now. We'll see how that changes over the next three or four months. We'll see how that changes. And hopefully it'll change in the direction of Chavez Ravine. But right now, I can almost name ten or a dozen teams that would be on the road to the World Championship before the Los Angeles Dodgers would be. Baseball being what it is, and it's such a great game, we never know what's going to happen. Who knows? Who knows? Trace Thompson could hit 35 home runs next year, and the Dodgers sweep into the World Series or whatever. No one knows anything. You know, no, no crystal ball can ever predict baseball. But just sitting here now, I'm not exactly uh, hot to trot with my uh, Dodger hat on. Um, be that as it may, whatever. Um, I know I, you're probably rolling your eyes saying, oh, man, he's putting the gosh on the Dodgers. There you uh, go. Again. <laughs> right. It's not their year. It's not their year. It's not their year. Right. Exactly. That worked for a while. Right. It did. That worked it for a while. Worked but right up, it worked right up to the end of the NLCS. <laughs> it did. It did. It did. And let's it, face it. You know. Let's face it. Let's face it, though. The Cubs, yeah. the Cubs had nowhere near the amount of obstacles the Dodgers had to overcome this year. And that's mm-hmm. one of the big reasons. Mm-hmm. Agreed. One of the manager of the year. Agreed. 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 And, uh, you know, the big bugaboo is the injury. The injury thing, you know, you cannot, no one can predict injuries. Right. No, but you the can't. Dodgers, the Dodgers were an outlier. They, they and the Mets had more, it was actually laughable. Every other day, a Met or a Yankee, I mean, a Met or a Dodger was on the DL. 
and they needed surgery and they weren't coming back and blah, blah, mm-hmm. blah, and blah, blah, blah. It just never ended. It was silly after a while. Yeah. It was actually silly. But um, we'll see what happens. It's a long off season. It'll be interesting. And I want to thank you for your contributions to tonight's show, the 1955 Dodgers, the 1981 Dodgers, and the 1988 Dodgers. You did a good job, and uh, thanks again. I'd like to say well, goodnight to our audience. And oh, let's, 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 also, let's also remember that we, uh, we had a wonderful honor of this goalie at the White House today. That was a oh, day. yes. Uh, giving him yes. a medal. It was yeah. wonderful. And I'm glad it was this president who gave it to him. Oh, us. absolutely. <laughs> yeah. we, need have, we need to have somebody with a little bit of uh, skin, class, and grace doing that. <laughs> well, you know something? I, I hate to say it, but I'm old enough to know that the odds are with my next statement in that I'll never see the likes or hear the likes of Vin Scully again in my lifetime. It's just, it's not going to happen. One of a kind. Nobody can duplicate that. No one should even try to to emulate him. They should just be themselves. But he's just, he's head and shoulders above everyone. Yeah. Yeah. I, 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 I still... It hasn't hit me all the way yet, but I know it will during the off season and when it gets close to spring training that we're not going to hear him again. <laughs> nope, you're not going to hear him. Yeah. Yep, and, that's sad. Yeah, and I, like I said, it's, it's still it's still so new that it really hasn't hit. But every year over, you know, my entire life, well, at least my entire life of being a, a big baseball fan. Every year when yep. the Dodgers are out there, you know, either they're disappointing end to the season or they're, you know, do glorious end to the season. I always knew that no matter what, we're going to still hear him the next spring. And believe me, during these last 29 disappointing off seasons, I'll tell you, it was really something to look forward to, uh, to knowing that. Mm-hmm. Be back in the spring well, and everything would be right with the world, and now we don't have that. <laughs> so the Dodgers right. are, are going to have to win because we don't have anything to console us when they lose. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good way to look at it, right? Yeah. Got to win. Yeah. Take it up. Take up the slack. All right, Linda. All right. Thank you very well, much. Have, I'm going to sign great. off, and we'll, okay. we'll we'll sign off for for. Uh, Dodgers baseball, Taylor Two Cities, Brooklyn to Los Angeles. This is Peter Trunk and Linda Wilson bidding you all a good night and thank you. Thank you. Good night.